different? Uh, it is uh, in the same suborder, Serrata, probably in the same family, Opus Tutidae. Uh, I'm not sure about the genus, and I would not. I think it's the same genus. Uh, probably was a smaller sized individual, uh, okay. but there are several genera, and I'm I'm not an expert in IDing uh, cephalopod to 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 a genus level. I can look it up, though. I think it was just also the way it was looking as it was on the bottom there, and now it's swimming. I remember the last time we saw swimming kind of reminded me of um, the tentacles look like seaweed or something. Yeah, because when they swim, they appear more elongated yeah. uh, and more streamlined, so that I probably when it starts swimming proper properly, it will also have, it will definitely have that streamlined shape. But w because it's closer to the bottom and also sitting down, so it's spreading uh, its tentacles more. You can just hold that heading, Jacob. It's fine. If you spin around, you'll probably pull me off. All right, that's great coverage. Do you know if any of the other watches saw any octopus? No, they did not. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, are we good? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Front row. That's beautiful. Everyone ready? Yep. Yeah. Are you ready, Dan? <laughs> It is a beautiful observation. Wow. I'm so happy it that is. we saw that. Oh, it's starting this one. It's like flapping the fins to swim away, but also kind of looks like it's waving goodbye <laughs> into the darkness. And just to finish off our recap after that wonderful interruption, um, this particular scene out, we're hoping okay. to get to the um, summit to see an area that we believe might have been impacted from past trawling activities. So as we explore, we're also looking at um, potential human impacts in this area. Yeah, I'll come. Should be on two three zero.
Do we know if we have all the samples we were intending to gather, or are we going to get some more? We're good on rocks. Yeah, good we're, on rocks. we're good on Fell rocks for sure. That. Um, nice. Yeah, I think we're in a good position unless we see something that's on our priority list or um, something really novel that we see in abundance that we haven't seen before. Right. Um, but we've collected um, samples number 40 through 55 on this dive, so we've got a good, you know, snapshot of what was here. Cool. Thanks so much, as always, for organizing all that, um, all those collections and data, Taylor. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. You do a great job, Taylor Ann. Thank you. And I just set an alarm in case we lose track of time. Sounds good. <laughs> It's really smart. Yeah. I don't know if you guys see this, but there's a big digital clock. Uh, right yeah. In yeah. Front of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I yes. tend to ignore that clock yes. unless I need it. Yeah. And also, <laughs> this is a watch which tends to ignore. Likes not to look at time. Sometimes. Have yeah, we seen some uh, bamboo coral webs? For sure. I'm still trying to get a better idea on the octopod that we saw. There are currently four genera in the family Opus thirty mm. I'm going to stumble every time I try to pronounce that. But I have been able to rule out one genus from the four. I'm still looking at three. Uh, That's a, a big start. Because they all look the same to me. Yeah. No, uh, I could rule out one genus because there's only two species and one from New Zealand and one from South China Sea. And they're probably found in much shallower waters. So that helps. Tell me which <coughs> which one of those two gauges drops first, the top left or the bottom right? What's that? Top left one falls on its face first. Every time. Crypto Teotis. Uh, this is Opus Teotis. Crypto Teotis. Crypto Teotis. What's up? Yeah, and uh, Grimpo Teotis. Hmm. So I think it is the genus Grimpo Teotis. But can we opus to do this as well? The I'm trying to ones get better descriptions drop it first, for each of the Are they exactly at the same time? So as we get closer to the um, summit and we see still some corals here, um, what kind of information does that um, tell you, Upashana, like um, potentially the level of impact from p past trawling or which species are more resilient or able to bounce back? I know for at least our shallow water um, like uh, habitat management, we try to consider uh, which species are most sensitive, which species are able to grow back quickly. Um, so is that kind of what we're thinking here? Or, um, yeah, just wondering what your Zoom thoughts are. Yeah, um, before I start, there was another sea star for yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so obviously the impact of trawling or any kind of anthropogenic activity on the deep sea communities is much poorly studied and less uh, is a lesser uh, studied uh, field than the shallower water, uh, obviously because of the accessibility issue. Um, so what we are looking for is, um, okay, because we're on a rocky substrate, we can't look at uh, trawl marks, but broken down colonies or... What, uh, the, uh, another one! Oh, yeah! There's another one! Oh another, do you want me to hold the ship? 
Or do you think we should keep going? No. I think we can keep I going. I think we should just keep going. Okay. Zoom as we, we can fly just, by. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy it as we, it goes by. Yes. It is not the same individual, right? I wouldn't <laughs> think so. Definitely not the same. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I think to be able to judge by abundance of what's there, we'd need previous data, which we don't have. Exactly. So right. Really I no get way a, to uh, DSC of this one. I don't know if you got any of the last one. Uh, quite a few. Zoom in. So we're thinking this is the Grim Grimpo to this to this? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That or the op opus to this. I'm still still trying to understand the difference between the two uh, genera. No, oh, keep moving. Yeah, we're, we're I would still think it's the Grimpo. Yeah, tutus. it looks. The the tentacles look very similar in that like kind of wrinkly. Exactly. Exactly, and the color, Texture. the size, and the thing. eyes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we're we're pretty good on shots from both. Yeah. Oh, the eyes just changed. It went from looking yeah. milky to to black. Ship's still moving all the time. So. Yeah. Roger. Then a few more, I think. That's our fourth one. Got to update our tally on the board. Mm -hmm. We try to get uh, at least 60 seconds of highlight video. Oh, okay. Got it. Yes, I would think that this is the genus Grimpotutus. Do these not camouflage themselves like other octopus? No, I don't think these change colors so much. They can probably... I have to look it up. I have, like... Okay, can Not go wide, seen. nice and easy. That uh, these deep sea octopods, especially these, uh, showing that kind of behavior. But it is a, it's quite a l large individual. Goodbye, friend. Bye. <laughs> yeah, uh, Kara, coming back to a question. So, um, some of the, uh, so, one thing would be fallen down fans, etc. And mm -hmm. in terms of Come management, <coughs> when it fire, comes please. to trawling, uh, I've seen it is quite difficult because you can um, either Just see patches uh, which have been trawled suddenly lack corals or organisms, but the, the adjacent parts would have higher density of corals and mm -hmm. fishes. Uh, in terms of management, uh, the I. It is very difficult to do taxon specific management at this yeah. step, so it is more at a habitat level and uh, reducing the impact on such areas because in shallower uh, uh, habitats, obviously, because of the shallower depths and accessibility, it is easier to do right. uh, species specific or taxa specific uh, conservations or taxa specific. Uh, regeneration uh, projects, which is very difficult at these depths. Uh, there are there are efforts to, I know for several scleractinians, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, where they are trying to, uh, uh, trying to recruit corals in the deeper sea, oh, deeper wow. ocean, and because of the large areas that were impacted by the oil spill, uh, and the uh, yeah, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so there are efforts. They're still trying to come up with the best practices right. of how to uh, grow those corals uh, in mesocosms and then transplant them back. Uh, there are several experiments going on. Uh, this, these are projects run by several labs. It's an ongoing project and yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I never really heard of deep sea coral yeah. restoration or <laughs> anything like that. Yeah, those are probably around like 1,200 meters, 1,000 wow. meters. And they're different. They're, they're trying different methods. One of them is, you know, just dispersing smaller recruits when you send down ROVs. Or mm -hmm. Others are probably, you know, putting in 
blocks where you have smaller corals, but it is also very difficult to ensure their reproductive success and growth uh, in mesocosms and then putting them back. So right. it, it's, an ex it's still at an experimental stage. Yeah. And Yeah, I know for shallow water coral restoration, it's already like um, a challenge to have enough people and time and like funding to monitor yeah. consistently. So for deep sea corals, it's exactly, like even more exactly. challenging. And also, I think it is more challenging for the octocorals. I, I mean, I don't know the exact reason, but from what I know about even shallow water coral restorations, uh, octocorals are notoriously difficult mm. to raise and oh, grow. Yeah. The train has definitely changed here a bit. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I guess one rough measure could be, you know, if we knew if you could ballpark the age of some of the corals on prominent points in an area and also be aware of wind trawling happened here last. So that maybe yes. would be... Yes, absolutely. If we have records of trawling, then it becomes easier uh, to understand that. And obviously you won't see some of those large fans but sometimes it's also difficult to understand that whether those habitats even had those fans because we do not have any baseline data. Yeah. And that is when comparison of uh, probably like something like a transect study model comes into use that, okay, if you're seeing, if we are not seeing corals in this transect as we move and continuously, continuously move in one direction, we see, okay, those fans are there and it's similar conditions and why wouldn't they be here? So that also correlates with the fact that, okay, there have been trawling in these areas. And I, sorry, yes. Can you re home the DBL, please? Sea stars, Brisinjid, a rat tail. I was going to say, I noticed an observation. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of spots uh, where it, it's like an outline of a sea star. Yes. It looks like yes. They, they're eating, yeah. whatever that is. Yeah, they're probably feeding on the bacterial mat or smaller organisms that's there yeah because for a moment i was like what there are sea stars but they're blank spots yeah yeah i thought it was just sediment but yeah, yeah. it's interesting Corals in general are very slow growing, but when you take them in the deep seeds, they even have a slower growth rate. So I, I think in the long term, it is always a better strategy, as with every other habitat. But I think for the deep sea, it becomes more crucial to protect and conserve the habitats before they are exploited, rather than, uh, af I mean, because I don't think we'll be ever be successful in our right. lifetime or in one individual's lifetime to even see that happening, uh, because they can be uh, their growth rate can be so slow. So right, right, yeah. Same thing with um, all types of habitat absolutely, restoration. Really, absolutely. like okay. um, even if you have an area th that there used to be a forest and then you yeah. plant those trees back, you probably won't have the same s assemblage of species no. that were there. The um, same animals that were using it so yes um, especially compared to like an old growth force so definitely and um, however we try however much we try we can never mimic all the factors at right. play that in a single habitat in a natural system we can right. only control a certain number of parameters and that will bias uh, the outcome largely right so number one is um, just prevent exactly <laughs> need for always restoration. Yeah. Always. Yeah, 
understand one group that um, I was kind of uh, following and listening to their um, learning from them was the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. Yes, yes. Um, they had a great, really great series of videos um, just for like, you know, introduction to the deep sea and all sorts of different basic topics. So I would definitely uh, recommend checking that out. Uh, if you want to learn more, the whole series is on YouTube, I believe. Yes. I think YouTube and they also have, I think, in podcast form and some other yeah. platforms. I can check also. Are glass sponges slow gro slow growing? Yes, uh, sponges. These deep sea sponges are also slow growing. Uh, I'm not exactly sure about the rate, but I can look it up. Yes, a lot of things in the deep sea are slow growing because the temperature, right? The really low yeah. temperature, and then also maybe food availability. Uh -huh. Low temperature reduces the metabolic rate, so that reduces the growth rate and also the nutrient availability, as you pointed out. Right, yeah. And thank you to our viewers from Italy, UK, uh, Japan, Germany, Canada, New Zealand, Korea, Hungary, Spain, Egypt, the Czech Republic, and Brazil. 
Thank you so much for tuning in from all over the world uh, to come explore with us. It's been a really amazing dive and we're so glad we get to um, see all this beauty and learn so much um, all with you live. So um, if you're on YouTube, feel free to also check out nautiluslive.org if you want to enter any questions, um, see educational resources, uh, have links to our social media pages, um, or also uh, click on some of the other um, camera views, which are also available on YouTube. Yeah, uh, We did notice our first octopus, for this watch at least, was um, actually noticed in the Atalanta view. Uh, so the view above Hercules, we noticed it swimming through that water. So definitely important to keep a eye out um, on all the cameras. <laughs> it looked like there was a pipe fish or, uh, mm -hmm. did you see that? Oh yeah, it's probably a snapper-branched eel or a, a halosaurus or ultramandrel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If anyone's unfamiliar with pipefish, they're relatives of um, seahorses, I believe, and they kind of look similar with that face of a seahorse, but then their body is um, like elongated and um, doesn't have that curved shape that a seahorse does, uh, hence the name pipefish. But was that a pipefish, or I kind of mm, missed it? It's hard I to hear the I think it was fan. a synaphobranchid eel. It was a what? Synaphobranchid eel. Is that a type of pipefish? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Is there a common name for that? Cutthroat eels. Okay, cutthroat, cutthroat eels. Okay. Looks like there's another, we're just going over it. That eel thing you talked about. Oh, another cutthroat eel? I don't see it. Do we have any idea of how the current um, is up here higher on the summit compared to um, lower areas of the summit? I'm not sure. I don't remember what the current readings were earlier. Um, actually, I think it's in our, I think it's in my dive plan. Let me check. Okay, and no pressure. I know um, you're navigating, so um, whenever you get a chance. We're basically just going in a line, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's a little more, um, a 
little more chill than when we first started the dives with the crazy cliffs and overhangs. There's another pipefish or whatever down there. Let's see. The cutthroat eel. Looks like a cementful branket, but we're too far away to actually ID it. But the shape Ooh. is definitely. Is that another huge oh, that, that's a sea so star. fat. It's very <laughs> fat. There's some fish and a very chunky sea star. <laughs> that is so big. Wow. Uh, I don't have it in here. Okay, no problem. Definitely a goni asteroid. Has little belly button. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's another one hanging off that yeah, ledge. Yeah, I was wondering if that was another white yeah. sea star. I was just gonna about to ask, you know, the current difference um, when you guys were talking about how things move through the water and how uh, the different organisms can eat them or find have food that way, and how I don't know because it's so flat. I'm surprised there's not much up here. Right. Yeah. It's oh, there's another sea star. Yeah. Yeah, the other one, the one that was hanging on the ledge was actually uh, feeding on a coral. It was feeding on a mm -hmm. coral? I think it was lodged oh. on top of a chrysogorget or something that looked like a chrysogorget from a distance. Wow. Oh, I thought that was another octopus, but it's just a glass sponge. <laughs> <laughs> No offense to glass Yeah, sponges. no offense to glass sponges. <laughs> Actually, um, when I um, interviewed for this position at the mm -hmm. Nautilus, and um, they asked me what my, like, if I were an animal, what would I be? I was like, sponge. <laughs> <laughs> and why did you say that? What, what's the story behind that answer? <laughs> um, I think sponges are like kind of underrated they're pretty oh, cool yeah, like a lot of people don't realize they're animals to begin with and um kind of like given my line of work i do a lot of stuff with habitats to improve mm -hmm. water quality um so sponges help you know filter the water improve water quali quality and then they're very um they have like all sorts of different cells that work together uh to make the sponge work like I believe collar cells that help create a current um, to draw that water in and then other cells that make those glass shard um, spicules that we were talking mm -hmm. about I believe to give it structure um, so and then cells that are undifferentiated so um, I also feel like I aspire to be as um, have a as diverse skill set. Skill set <laughs> as a sponge. Yeah. And, you know, that uh, is people. actually a very difficult question. That if, I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> if given a choice, what animals we would be? I mean, I think the answers will also de change according to the habitats we are choosing. Yeah, true. <laughs> I don't know if it was a deep sea habitat, if I would still choose sponge, but. <laughs> well, like a marine versus terrestrial. And What's that? A marine versus terrestrial, I think yeah. your choices will also. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an answer if you were to get put on the spot at interview? Kajana, <laughs> what deep sea animal are you? Deep sea? I think... Um, or or just animal in general, doesn't matter. Oh, that's a difficult deep question. Deep <laughs> I could go on for hours probably. I figure I would never easier, come yeah. to an answer. <laughs> Not a human being, I know that one. <laughs> deep sea... Uh, I wouldn't want to be a benthic 
organism I would want to be exploring, so something mm, which is not yeah. benthic. Yeah. Mm, uh, so not sponge. <laughs> not sponge or corals. Can, I can be one of those squat lobsters. I really love how they Aww. swim. <laughs> like taking swimming lessons. <laughs> uh, or I can be one of those uh, deep sea scorpionoid fishes, the frog Ooh. fishes. I always love how all the little tentacle like things that they have. No, they're not te tentacles, but extensions over the wow, body. Yeah. Uh, or a small, a, a small. Uh, yeah, like a small amphipod. I mean, it's large. It's, it's different. <laughs> Basically anything that can move. Yeah, that's more <laughs> mobile, but also can live in the deep. Mm. I think squat lobs is a good option. Then I can like hop from one fan to another. Oh, I love that. You yeah. did. You always got excited when we saw the squat lobsters. Yeah. <laughs> And I assume since we see so many of them, they're doing like pretty well they here. Do they do pretty can well, yeah. Eat all sorts of different types uh -huh. of things. And they get to live in the very beautiful coral fans <laughs> or oh yeah, along the sponges. Yeah, like those shrimp that mm -hmm. take up residence and those yeah. Yeah, beautiful glass sponges. I think with a terrestrial animal, I would I either want to be an elephant or a bird. <laughs> Specifically, you do not want to be those? I said? want to oh, be. Okay, I would okay. want to be. Gotcha. I, I love elephants. <gasps> Have you been able to see an elephant in real life? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. A bunch of times. Really? Wow. Was it um, like at a at the zoo? Or no, no, no. I, I, I'm not considering those. I am not a zoo person. I dislike zoos. Is your but mm. it was because I, when I used to work on terrestrial conservation, so uh, oh, really? wild elephants in our country, as well as uh, when wild elephants are fall sick or they go rogue or something, the forest department takes them and the forest department uses the elephants for tracking animals mm, and protecting yeah. the forest. So I, I've interacted with those elephants and there are wonderful stories wow. regarding those as well. Uh, so yeah, interactions with elephants have been numerous times and wow. it's a pleasure. I think I would also, elephants and rhinos, they are my oh. favorites. That's amazing. I had no idea you were working in terrestrial conservation yeah. before you became a deep sea coral <laughs> <laughs> biologist. That's crazy. <laughs> That's so awesome. I can tell you guys those stories later. Yeah. <laughs> We've been chased by rhinos multiple times. Oh my times. gosh. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can we, we can save those stories for later. <laughs> yeah, that's a, just a little bit terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it was at that moment terrifying, but also hilarious looking back. <laughs> How about you, Hans? Do you have an animal that you would be? Deep sea oh, or I otherwise? Oh, I was afraid of that. <laughs> oh, everybody's going to be put on the spot yeah. now. <laughs> Not, not in the ocean, no. No? Not in the ocean. No, no. Oh. I'm a mammal. Okay. <laughs> no. I, uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, camels are ships of the desert. Wow. And they, and they spit. <laughs> so Cam so camels are also okay. wonderful animals. I've so worked with camels also, so... They are, they are intriguing. It's got a lot going for it. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally not expecting <laughs> a desert animal <laughs> to be your answer. It's a, sh well, it's a ship of the... There's a yeah. maritime element to it. It's yeah. a maritime ship, element. Of, the ship of the desert. Ship of the desert. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are fascinating animals. Yeah. Having worked with them also, they are fascinating. And they can have... They have beautiful personalities. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, eh? Yeah, and we know you're busy, Taylor, so... Um, oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, deep sea animal. Or any deep other Deep sea animal. and then terrestrial. Okay. Terrestrial, probably 
Okay, no, it's not any easier. <laughs> um, oh, how about shallow water versus yeah, deep water? Yeah. Okay, whale shark. Oh, oh yes, um, yes. Definitely would want to be a gentle giant. Um, <laughs> and deep sea, not too sure. Let me think about that. Um, I guess I could also just pick my favorite deep sea animal. Yeah. yeah. Which would be the Dumbo octopus. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Uh, that was a halosaurid in Andros and Sinapha Branket that we just saw. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I was wondering what that was. Now being a squid that can eject ink is also fun. Are there any cuttlefish in the deep sea? Or are they usually more shallow? Squids? Uh, or yeah, cuddle, cuttlefish? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, squids. We have uh, deep sea squids. But I have to check the depth distribution. They go deep. Mm, definitely around 2,000 meters, 2,500 meters. But I don't know if they are found in. Yeah, I'm not sure about a cuttlefish specifically. Yeah, squids um, do. Yeah, but the cuttlefish I'm Don't seeing go to about no. like 200 or 2,000 feet or 600 yeah, meters. Yeah, yeah. Squids are deep sea squids. <laughs> yeah, cuttlefishes are more shallow. What I makes those trace of lines there? Is that a uh, trail for like a holotheria or something? Or? Yeah. They can be the bacterial uh, mat, something that has been feeding on it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And sometimes it's just like how the bacterial mats grow. I mean, we have had this discussion on, on I've heard people discussing this and I've never released. I don't think anybody has a perfect answer, mm. but definitely something feeding on the bottom sediment or how uh, sediment has settled because we are so looking so closely at it Interesting, random, yeah. dark, a dark piece of basalt or whatever. Yeah. Uh, a little island, so to say. Yeah. Mm. Uh, no, I think we can move on. Yeah. <laughs> I part. think so. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> For deep sea creatures, I think I'd like to be a jellyfish. Mm -hmm. Mostly water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mostly. No thoughts. <laughs> Just floating around. <laughs> Just floating. <laughs> <laughs> and you could have that amazing um, bioluminescence. Yeah. Oh, one of the siphonophores also, you know, with the mm, long tail. Yeah. That you can just what about a terrestrial animal? Oh, man. Terrestrial animal? I think I'd like to be a house cat. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually fun. That's Live a good life. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a big sea star coming up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think two. We're seeing two. Yeah. Pink and orangish. Yeah. Really stands out in this landscape. Oh, there's yeah. another one. Mm hmm. Is that a drop off over there? To the left? It's just like a big boulder. Oh, it's a boulder. Yeah. The shadow made it look like yeah. a, a, it drop a drop off. off yeah. yeah. Trick of the eye. Are those sponges on the side? Yes. 
Okay, I think the more reddish one was a uh, Sorciaster or another fish coming through. Mm. Okay, I just saw the tail. Caliaster. Caliaster or Sorciaster. They look, they can look very similar, at least to me. I think Caliaster. The more whitish one, it's difficult to ID. It's interesting we see a bunch of these sea stars at the close to the summit. Um, any idea what they're eating? Like things in the sediment? Yeah, or? probably the bacterial mat and smaller organisms in the sediment. Uh -huh. You Mostly can see the like right the there. Patterns, yeah. There's patterns where the sea stars are eating. Yeah. Oh, there's like a like just blob a sea star snow angel. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, snow angel. Yeah, that that's actually a perfect description. Yeah, there's one in the center of the screen yeah. now. Let's see. <laughs> that's so interesting. I've yeah, never seen that before. One. That's definitely from a big one. Have you seen this before, Pashna? Like sea stars leaving? Oh, very cool. It's probably a bamboo coral that's coming up. Or a sponge stone. There's a metallogorgia. We're seeing some sponges, old glass sponges, some bamboo whips, a hormetid venous fly trap and enemy. Bridge nav. Singed. Oh, that's a beautiful metallogorgia. A couple of metallogorgias, actually. That's a big sea urchin on the sea floor. Well, that's what it looked like. We passed it. Looks like something moved, had moved in that corner, the boulders or something. There's an empty patch. Hmm. Is that a different type of substrate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. 
another cornea asteroid in the corner, the vault area, euplectalid, metallogorgia. Chrysogorgia. The thing in the corner looks like a Dr. Seuss character. <laughs> I think I have Coralium out for a long time. The, the like yellowish thing yeah. next to the sponge? The, the red stock with the yellow yeah. fan on top. Is that a crinoid on something? Yeah, that's a crinoid on a Hemicoralium. Mm. And also the vault area has folded in a very interesting manner. It's so tall that it bent under its own. Yeah. Mm. Also looks kind of like Dr. Seuss mm -hmm. <laughs> vibes. Yeah. But there's another Solaster sea star. Mm -hmm. There are some lines um, yeah, I was gonna going. Say, yeah, do you I think these are trawling marks. Maybe I don't know. Oh, uh, they I'll look like striations in that substrate, but yeah, I don't think they would be very small etched patch. like that. That's yeah. pretty small. Generally, trawling lines are yes, exactly. Yeah, we probably would see more I evidence, especially right here. But that was definitely interesting. Something that moved different. that rock probably. We're on the same wavelength, Taylor Ann. <laughs> Solasterid, asteroid, Coney asteroid. Has there been work to um, kind of characterize the microbial communities in these microbial mats that you were talking about, potentially? Uh, I'm not sure exactly whether in these habitats in these areas, but there has been work. There are people who work on bacterial mat communities in the mm. deep sea. I imagine so it's like... Yeah. There's difficult. Fishes. <laughs> there's one fish and there's a shadow of something. Ooh. Yeah, that's just a rock. What's the red thing on the seafloor? Probably a shrimp. Yeah. Looks like it has a shrimp shape. Mm -hmm. viewers, we are 
I'm trying to make it to our final waypoint at the summit. Um, so we are going um, over this area and not really zooming too much on any particular critters unless um, there's particular uh, scientific interests. So um, we are kind of just trying to make up for some time earlier when it was uh, harder to navigate around those large rocks and there was a lot more um, corals than we were sampling. So for now, we'll just be uh, transiting without focusing too much on one particular organism. It's interesting how some of these um, basalt rocks look smooth, almost shiny-like. Mm. Does anyone know why they look like that in comparison to like botryoidal, the grape light textured rock? I have no idea. Hans? I don't know. We sure could use Val or Hannah. <laughs> Let's go wake them up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they would love that. <laughs> they probably actually would. <laughs> There's another, yeah. Yeah. It looks so much like a pipefish from here, but you said it's a... In that's a halosaurid. Uh, halosaurid. Let cut, me look up what is the... No, this is not a cutthroat eel. Oh, okay. Those were the okay. cinephobranchids. These are okay. the halosaurids. Halosaurs or mm -hmm. aldrovandria. Depend we have to look at the head, but that's fine. It's in the family halosauridae. Pipefishes. Let me look them up if they're related to these. Or rather, I should say, closely related to these, because everything is related. <laughs> At some point, they're related. Mm -hmm. They're both fish, bony fish, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> the largest group of So definitely acting up uh, And also every organism is related. <laughs> I think pipefishes are a very shallow one water. Let's look it up. Mm. There's a really round pipe looking thing right there. Almost center screen. Oh, is that maybe is a, a dead sponge? sponge yeah. yeah. There are some pretty big boulders around mm -hmm. here. And, yeah. You know, we're not at the upper flats yet. I'm, I'm not a fisherman or a, a trawler captain, of course. I'd imagine they'd be hesitant to put their gear down into this area. You know, they would lose it. But if they don't know, because it's been unexplored, you know. Yeah. Then uh, <laughs> it, it's not the upper flats. There's yeah. a cask eel. The one that we just passed over. Yeah. I think there was another one that swam by. It was about to say flew by. Yeah, pipe fishes are shallow water fishes. And um, they're in a different order. Looks like there aren't any deep sea mm. pipe fishes. Yeah. At least this is what I can find out right yeah, now. Yeah. They are mostly marine. There are just a few freshwater pipe fishes, but they are found uh, in coral reefs or seagrass beds, so definitely Very within shallow. the first 50 to 100 meters of depth. Mm. Very cool. I didn't know there was freshwater pipe fish. Yeah, I, I knew that there were freshwater because I know that I think there's at least one kind of freshwater pipe fish that is found in Louisiana. Oh, so really? Wow. Cool. There may be more. I know that there are freshwater pipe fish are found there. So at least one kind. Mm -hmm. Don't know more. I wish I knew more about fishes. We have just over an hour left in this dive mm -hmm. before we ascend. Do you think we will be able to make it? I don't know. 
Okay. We are 800 meters away. Are we moving at full speed? Or? Uh, we're moving at 0.3 knots, so not insignificant. So we could potentially increase our speed a little, or no. I'm not sure if that's the objective to really yeah. reach that point and make sure we see that, or? Yeah. it kind of um is there a limit for the speed based on like the tether and not wanting to bump the rov into anything i assume or yeah and uh that would be a dan question he has spl off mm. or jake what's the question uh they were asking about speed limits for rovs being safe it depends. Depends on, uh, I'll say, the bathymetry. Mm. Our personal speed record is four knots. Four, not zero point four. No, four knots. Four so. knots. That's impressive. Oh, wow. But uh, most um, average ROV speed is uh, 0.25 meters a second or half a knot. Depends on what you're doing. For a transect like this, they like to do uh, 0.3 for uh, just the slow even speed so they can count all the yeah the grad students counting everything yeah if you're annotating video this is a kind of ideal speed uh, commercial world they pick it up a little bit half a knot usually for survey seafloor survey hmm. But they're not uh, annotating, and it's usually not uh, densely populated. I'd be good with half a knot if you feel like that uh, we still get data visually and make all good speed to the waypoint. Uh, Dan was just saying that the speed is good for the people who have to review the footage. Uh huh. So. The problem uh, with this system at half a knot is um, we get more of an excessive layback. So if we want to stop and look at something, yeah, uh, you know, Atlanta will be a ship length or so behind. Mm. Seems to be a it's kind of our magic speed here. Thanks for clarifying that. Those are some very beautiful We do half a knot occasionally mountains. if we're covering ground over flat bottom, but with the uh, big boulders in the terrain here and, so, and the uh, density of animals, that's oh, kind of our Goldilocks yeah. speed. Potential octopus sightings. <laughs> Is the waypoint. It's about 800 meters. And we should make the waypoint. Oh, hour. 775 meters, so yeah. Yeah, 1,000 meters an hour basically yeah. at this speed. Or a kilometer an hour. Or 10 meters a minute, whatever you
Nautilus has an eclectic mix of metric and imperial mm. pound meters. Yeah. Depth of meter, but speed of knot. Tried to get them to switch over to meters per second, but they have, or meters per minute. The winch reads in meters per minute, so. Yeah, that'd be nice if you had the same. The same units. Or yeah. Anything. Yeah, it makes it a little easier. A lot easier. I mean, a lot more areas of a run if you're not using two different. Especially if you're trying to do something quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another one of the Cascades. No, no, not Cascade. That's a Halo Solid. Do you tell the difference between those? Between um, the one that you were just mentioning. Oh, okay, yeah. The, uh, cusk eel or yeah. cut eel, cutthroat eel oh, or cusk eel. Yeah, those are both different things. Yes, <laughs> cusk eels. Um, the shape is very different. It's ha it has a much bigger head and then oh, a flatter okay. body, and which gradually tapers into the tail. Mm -hmm. And um, Halosaurids and Cinephobranchid really eels, or the cutthroat eels, both have very elongated eel-like structures. Pretty terrain. Mm, but Halosaurids have, how should I put it, like a, this, I feel a distinct knot after the head, and the head Ooh. is a little different, and is whiter. Mm -hmm. And Cinephobranchid eels are more, um, they look, they seem to have like a more solid structure. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to explain how I, how it, how I visually, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think if we looked at images side by side, right. then it's very evident. That yeah. Yeah, cascades are very different shapes. For a second, I thought from the angle that the, it had a big rounder oh, head, yeah. so that's why gotcha. I called it that. The speed also allows the, over terrain like this, it allows the DVL and the autos to compensate if we're going faster we would have hit that's the rock a, yeah that's Sounds a beautiful good. percentage in a basket style there's sponges we're seeing more sponges it's also interesting how the, the the rocks over there have the pattern as if it's the striated the stri are these sheep flows or yeah, that's very interesting. Probably sheet flows. I don't know. We'd need a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can also make wild guesses, but that's more dangerous <laughs> than anything else. I mean, here's a wild guess. At some <laughs> point, the plume has to push up underneath yes. the oceanic yes. plate, right? Yes. So the oceanic plate is very much older yes. than the initial magma plume. Mm -hmm. and the oceanic plate can be compressed sediments, even uh, calcareous sedimentary rocks or something like that. And I would wonder if some of those older sediments remained at near the top of the... Yeah. Of the of the plume and just got carried up and carried up covered up. over with flows, mm. extrusive flows, but nonetheless the the old plate pieces are there. But that is just a dangerously wild stab in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds logical, and also it reminded me of how you know uh, block mountains look like mm -hmm. when they move. So it kind of reminded yeah. me of that 
factor. Yeah, most with mm. strata. And this way, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but again. I feel like that's a lot of deep sea stuff is like, <laughs> we're still figuring it out. Yeah, so. Terry Kirby in the Pisces subs always called these things carbonate rocks. Carbonate boulders. Hmm. And who is that um, that you just mentioned? Terry Kirby. Hmm. He's the um, yeah. operations director and senior pilot for the Pisces submersible program. Oh, wow. oh. cool. I just yeah when we were when we got back to shore from my mapping transit, John Smith was on our his name is John Smith uh, <laughs> was on uh, our watch and he showed us the Pisces one and two on land, not underwater. <laughs> Pisces four and five. Uh, I think it was one and two. Four and five. Four five. Yeah, the ones in the hangar there. Yeah, there are a bunch of Pisces submersibles built back in the eighties. Wow. Well, a bunch, not many, but... I think he said they're for sale, if you're interested. We had a question in the chat. What is a guillot? Um, would either of you like to explain? About a guillot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like how how they are formed, their general shape. Oh, that's out of syllabus for me. I can look it up. That's in the geologic structure, right? Oh. Yeah. I believe generally guillots are um, sea mounts that have a flattened top. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of like if you're imagining like a plateau. Yeah. Yeah, underwater volcanic mountain with a flat top. Yeah, seems like a, un yeah, you're right, underwater plateau. That's how it seems like. <laughs> that is a it's a shark. shark. What? Yeah. It's giving us a little show. Yeah, there's a helisaur yeah. thing. Do you know what kind of shark that was? No, I can look it up. I don't know why I'm thinking cat shark, but that's yeah. not the right. Is that are, are those I like don't a know. <laughs> I mean, can be a cat shark, but not to look it up. Yeah, and a beautiful hell is already, whom we ignored as soon as we realized that there was a... So, I didn't see any evidence when we crossed it, but um, those uh, lines in the sonar... Were you thinking that was trawling? Yeah, they usually show up in the sonar. 
I didn't uh, see it in her sonar at all. Might just be a anomaly with the bathymetry. It's cornered up a little bit. They're usually pretty distinct in the sonar. There are 160 species which are called a cat shark. Oh wow. So it's a little difficult to narrow down. Yeah. From our brief sighting. And also we didn't get a great look on it. Um, right. And also, I think for a lot of them, need to have like a size reference, as approximate size. So, Have you guys ever seen fossils on any of your ROB dives? Yeah. Yeah? Is that a CO2? Oh, is that uh, a... I forget what that pom-pom anemone is called. Yeah, the jesters had... Um, oh, Coralimorpharia. But I'm not sure if that was a... It looked like a Coralimorpharia. Uh, Dan, what did you say about the fossils? Uh, they were, uh, I forget if they were a jawbone or a tusk. They're on the, uh, highlights are on the website there. Was uh, that the whale beak? Yeah, the whale beak. Yeah, yeah that was pretty yes, cool. Yeah. yeah, we got confirmation um, from Tina that that was a pom-pom and enemy. Yeah, so Coralimorph, yeah. I don't think that's a Coralimorph. That is what's called the pom pom. No, pom pom is a different one. Yeah, I think it's different. That's great listening to the uh, Limp liponema. biologists and the geologists fighting over where it was going to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you guys collect it? Yeah, it was technically picked up as a uh, fossil, so it went geologist one. Oh, okay. <laughs> How big was it? Did it fit in the box easily? No, we had to hold it the whole time. <laughs> hold it on the whole time. <laughs> yeah, that was impressive. It didn't fall out during recovery. Yeah, yeah the palm. It's uh, ancient. The liponeumens are different. Yeah. You're right. And just to add on to your question, Mia, I believe um, they also found a megalodon tooth. Oh, wow. A fossilized megalodon tooth um, last year in 2022 uh, during their expedition to the um, Johnston Atoll. Mm. Oh, that's not far. Yeah, I like to look, at, look for fossils near the Calvert Cliffs in Maryland on the shore. 
They just fall off the cliff. Wow. Everyone goes looking for shark teeth, but there's so much more there. I found invertebrae and and nice shells intact, fossilized coral, and some shark teeth, but not a not a megalodon. <laughs> That's awesome. That's such a diversity of different kinds of fossils in one spot. Yeah, I know you can literally look at the cliff and just falling, the whole cliff is just fossils. Wow. I really, yeah, I think these are sheet flows, if I remember from Geology. My, my past time <laughs> sitting in the van with ge geologists. Okay, but that's I great. could be wrong. <laughs> We're less than 600 meters, guys. Ooh, the Yeah, the. Did you say sheet flows? Yeah, yeah, like a like a bed sheet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think uh, when I was covering a lunch shift earlier, Hannah was saying that the sheet flows are the ones that um, flow really quickly, yes. and the pillow flows are the slower ones. Uh. She said there's one in between that, but I didn't remember what she <laughs> called it. Yeah. Oh, the lobate, maybe? Ooh. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. So I, I'm just throwing out the only geological <laughs> terms I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's when we were looking at, like, earlier in this seamount, when we were seeing, like, the blocky Either. type of uh, the forms. Yeah, the so she angular. Was saying it may have been a result of that. Um, middling type of flow. Yeah, I reckon so. Ooh. Yeah, I think that's one of the best things about Nautilus is just being able to um, have lunch with someone and learn about all sorts of different topics. I definitely still have to, on the top of my list, Upashana is hearing your rhino story. <laughs> 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 there's, a, there's also um, a comment from the viewers saying, like, you can't trust drop, <laughs> drop that in <laughs> and not tell us the story. <laughs> so definitely looking forward to that. Really? Well, we'll do, we'll share, I'll share those on one of the transit days. <laughs> yeah. I can, I, I may have pictures of those rhinos somewhere. Wow. Like, I, I, I'll see if I can find them. Bridge now. Oh, there's a big sea star. <laughs> what are those called, the ones with the extra legs? I think they're in the family Solasteridae. I don't know the genus, probably the genus Solaster, but in the family Solasteridae. Yeah, it looks like this is going to be a little slightly steeper.
on the last watch, I think they um, they got the collection of the Labea shrimp that's been associated with sponges, and I've been seeing quite a few shrimp laying nearby a couple of these uh, frayed sponges here too. Mm. So that's considered one of the more like novel um, interactions? Yeah, I think typically we see shrimp associated with different coral species, and mm. so we have a biologist interested in studying the association between the shrimp and sponges. Mm. Um, that is Mary Wickets, Wickets Wixton at T Texas A&M, uh, interested in studying that. Very cool. What is like the distribution across, um, I, I assume, a lot of institutions that the samples get sent to, like all over the U.S. or internationally? Yeah, so <laughs> the way that this cruise is working is um, most of our, or all of our samples are going to our partners at um, CZ and GSO and all the scientists that um, kind of had a conversation with us before the expedition and talked about species of interest um, kind of got put on this overall list that we will be able to notify um, them of what species we did collect on, on our expedition. So I have a list here of all the interests, um, the collections of interests in the different uh, professors or people interested in looking at them. Wow. Um, yeah, so typically they like to uh, request their own samples from MCZ, I think, rather than us subsampling, and that's a, a new th change for me this year, which and is, yeah. Sorry, can you, um, do you know what MCZ is? Oh, yeah, the Museum of Comparative Zoology at gotcha. Harvard, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, for any viewers curious, we have very um, specific sampling protocols. Um, we're not just taking um, anything that we see. Um, we're really focusing on um, biological co collections that are going to help our understanding of the range of these organisms, if it's like a new um, sighting in this particular place, um, potential novel associations like we just talked about, um, uh, better improved understanding of interactions between organisms. Um, possible new species, but we also um, do not collect if we only see one of those. Uh, we count um, their abundance and um, only collect if we, we've seen a few already. Um, so, um, and for geological samples, there are also other um, conditions, um, certain sizes and um, generally more angular rocks, um, and lots of other uh, specific permit details, so definitely something we carefully approach um, with our sampling strategy. So Taylor Ann, do the, all the samples, you're saying all the samples we collect on these voyages eventually um, live at, at MCC or? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I forget what GSO stands for, geological, some repository, but that's the other place we're sending the geological okay. samples. And yeah, um, so usually uh, the, those samples will, yeah, just live there at the museum. And if scientists want to do research, on them, they can um, put in a request. So there's like a our sample ID number that we have, and then MCZ will create their own like catalog number um, that scientists can use to request a portion of that sample. So it, yeah, uh, part of my job is to make sure we make a huge list of all the samples and what they are, and any subsamples that are um, possible. So like if there were associates um, attached to a sponge, for example. Um, that would be noted so that, you know, the scientists would know, oh, okay, this is what I was looking for in this expedition. Um, so we create like a master sample sheet and separate it by institutions of interest and uh, where the samples are going. Uh, and that, yeah, that's actually very useful. One of the products that we give all the scientists when they walk off the ship. 
Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much for your organizational skills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a really great system set up uh, before I got here. So, <laughs> yeah, it works really well. And that's all of the samples that we take are in the public domain, right? So if you have a, if you're anyone wanting to do research can just do, put in the request and See access that. Yeah. Have you used museum samples before, Upashana? Yeah, I largely use museum samples because um, obviously I use sam recent samples which have been collected in the last couple of years during most of the uh, several deep sea expeditions, some from Nautilus. I have a couple of samples from Nautilus. I have quite many samples from the Okeanos, uh, some from the Falco, the Smith Ocean uh, Institute, the Falco ship, their Emperor Seamounts cruises. So yes, those definitely come like direct requests, but all my other samples are museum uh, loans because all the previous crews, before I act like before I started my project, all the samples that had been collected in the previous years, they are in uh, the museums. So for example, uh, I most of my samples are either from the Smithsonian Institution or the California Academy of Sciences. Mm. And that they range from, they, some of them are, some of them are, I think the oldest sample that I, I have used, I have examined samples which are fairly old from 1970, early 1900s. Oh. But the ones that I have used for my genetic analysis, I think the oldest would be uh, maybe 1980s, late, late oh. 1980s. So. so you're taking like little pieces of them yeah. for yes. um, like DNA extraction? Exactly. Yes, so I went to both, both of those institutions and uh, worked with them for a while and got my subsamples. So they are basically loans. So uh, the way it happens is that if I am left with any tissue material after I have done my analysis, I, I will be returning them back to the museums. And if I have used up all the tissue in the process, then first I have to, then, then I'm not returning. There's nothing to return, but at the same time, all I have to uh, inform them about every outcome and data, whatever oh. I have. Oh. So. Thanks for sharing that. It's interesting to know like um, these collections and how they're yes. utilized. So yes, and also the paratypes and holotypes of... So holotype uh, is basically the, the specimen which, based on which the original taxonomic description for that particular species or genus was written. So that is called the holotype. And other specimen that were examined along with the holotype and looks like the holotype are called the paratype. So for for several of the taxa that we work with, several of the octocorals, the holotypes and paratypes are in these museums. So we can all so if they're very old paratypes or holotypes then and because of preservation methods, different preservation methods also, we cannot take subsamples anymore from them, but we can always examine them. So it is mm -hmm. also a good practice. So it, I mean while I was at both of these uh, institutions, uh, if I brought back, say, 50 samples, I'm, give, I'm just giving a random number, I have uh, studied maybe over 100 to look at the morphology, to study the morphology. So it is a very uh, enriching experience to be in these museums and going through their collection and also a very exciting process because you get to see the like hundreds and hundreds of collection. You're going through the cabinets, pulling them out. It's like a, uh, yeah, it's like a mystery that you're trying to solve, yeah. and it's like a treasure trove that you're going through. I imagine so there's yeah. all sorts of like jars of oh yeah, stuff absolutely. Of, <laughs> like what is that? <laughs> like a kid in a candy store. Yeah. <laughs> Except it's like preserved. <laughs> That's how I felt when I went uh, looking at the different maps in the Library of Congress, because yeah. there were so many that weren't even cataloged. Exactly. So there's, you know, mystery. Just went through a bunch of them. You looking into that hole there? Yeah, 
I did see a sample jar of a preserved mola mola eye before, and it was like huge. <laughs> oh. So crazy to get a scale of some of these things too in those preservation jars. Yes. Also, my uh, external committee member, Ga Dr. Gary Williams, he's uh, at the California Academy of Sciences. So that was also an advantage that while I was here, I got to work with him closely and learn a lot about sea pens from him. And mm. so that was another great experience. I got to meet Gary before my first, I think it was my internship Is year. Gary? Yeah, uh, I sailed he with was him. On, he was yeah. on board? I think, yeah, I believe oh, it was the okay. same Gary Williams. Yeah, the you said the CAA. Yeah, CAS? CAS, yeah, 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 yeah. I believe it was, yeah, very friendly. He's very, very knowledgeable friendly. person. Absolutely. Yeah. He's a very nice person and a very nice mentor to have. Uh, Brid uh, Bridge now. Yeah. Is there um, a particular mentor that, um, like, has really helped you before? And I know, like, when we're talking about, like, careers and Ocean Exploration Trust especially likes to, um, like, showcase people's journeys. So um, is there a particular mentor that um, has helped you, like, really uh, get where you are now? Yeah, so if it is about the deep sea and the kind of work that I currently do, it would definitely be. I mean, I have had a great experience working with my advisor, Dr. Scott Franz, and mm. uh, yes, it has been a very exciting and enriching and a, it's a very, it has been a very wholesome journey. And I think I, in, I enjoy working with him. I, we have a great lab, everybody in the lab. Uh, it's a great working culture that we have. So it, that it, that experience itself has helped me a lot. Nice. And um, I mean, there are several other people. Obviously, I'm, if I'm talking about my grad <coughs> journey, and even before that, uh, like back in India, especially working, I remember. I mean, I'm still very much in contact with. But one of my mentors there, he has been. Um, he has been a mentor in every sense and is one of the people that I always bounce, use, use as a, you know, a sounding board and I can sit down and discuss about work, even though we currently work on very different uh, fields and ideas, but is a person that I can always, you know, have a discussion about work and be like, okay, does this sound logical and has, um, has been a mentor in as many ways as possible. Like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, but yeah. That's a pretty interesting boulder. Very interesting. Yeah, there's a squat lobster up there for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's waving, it's <laughs> waving at you. Don't miss the boulder, come on. <laughs> <laughs> there's a line down yeah. this little slash. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's sure breaking what that. apart. I don't know. It's like a crack. In a layman's term, a crack, not <laughs> <laughs> in yes. a geological sense, because I know Fracture. that. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Fractures and cracks, they have very different meanings mm. in geology. For you, it's just a crack in the rock. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know what you mean, Mia. For me, it's the box pulls at the National Archives. You know, when those trolleys come out with the boxes on them and you, you open that box yeah. up and realize that you're the first person to look at those mm -hmm. documents since they were put in there some Absolutely. hundred years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like climbing up those stairs and getting those jars and I'm like, okay, what if I drop them? <laughs> what if I drop them? Oh, I imagine it would smell so bad. <laughs> like biological yeah. samples. I'm pretty well, if they're in ethanol, then no. General, no. Uh, the, the, the social scientists are chatting here now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 
<laughs> I'm pretty clumsy, so uh, it's probably good things aren't in jars for me. Just have to worry about accidentally tearing. Or like spilling coffee? Are you oh, not allowed to bring they're very any food? Stri they're so strict. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I took a class. I did training for the National Archives. I, I found a lot of stuff online. I, didn't know I did not go in person. But yeah, there are a lot of rules. You can only, if you have a bundle of something like photographs, you can only take out, if you have a, like a folder with a bunch of uh, folders inside of, of different groupings of photographs, you can only take out one folder at a time. You have to have a little marker. You have to wear gloves if it's not protected. Oh. So yeah, a lot of rules. At least they're preserved. I know um, in like my work, there's been some documents that just um, weren't, you know, there's just so many documents and then some of them get lost or um, just shredded or something. And then we lose that information forever, basically. So i um, really glad that those documents are preserved. Yeah. in your history of work, were there any like particular documents that you were really amazed to find and be able to work with? Yeah, pretty much all of them. <laughs> we have 400 meters. Do you think we're going to make it? Yeah. Another hour. There was a shipwreck at Kure Atoll. It mm -hmm. was a Civil War. Sea pen, sorry. <laughs> side wheel steamer. Uh, hour trip up. And it happened in 1870. Mm -hmm. It stranded the men on the atoll for about four or five months. Wow. They rescued wow. what they could. They built their own boat on the beach there. Wow. for volunteers to sail it back. They had a lot of time on their hands. So they had small scraps of paper that they used for writing letters to their loved ones and making wow. sketches of their survivors camp. Yeah, all those things still exist. And they were able to preserve those documents? Yep, they were rescued. Wow. Five volunteers went in the, the modified gig and they sailed some 1,500 miles back. They were so emaciated when they made it to Kauai that the boat rolled in the surf and four of them died. Oh, oh no. The last <laughs> That's <laughs> a terrible... It was, a long, sorry, it was a long time ago, people. <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay, but... Uh, yeah, and the last one carried the word to the, the kingdom and uh, the, the king sent a steamer up to pick them up. I mean, I think just to make it that far and then um, four of them pass away clo so close to the finish line is a... Yeah. Yeah. Wow, so you were able to see those physical documents? Sure. Were they... Um, can I, can I ask like, like what materials they ended up using? Because you said they were stranded on um, the atoll, right? Was it like, um, it's not like they just have paper they can use? Well, you know, they, they marched back and forth in the lagoon carrying everything they could off the ship till it broke oh, up. okay. So there were some supplies then? Yeah, you had to get off, you know, all kinds of stores if you could rescue them wanted to make sure to get the manacles to lock up the unruly sailors now and then.
So a question for the front row for, for off the bottom, is that something Daniel comes up for or is that something that uh, you guys just instigate and do at the proper time? I think, I mean, we just kind of talk it over. I, I know previously they've they've had times slotted, but you know they said they want us to get up by four, and then we can do a little math to figure out how long it's going to take. Okay, so on deck by four. Roger, on deck at four. It's probably about a fifty-minute, one-hour ride up. Okay, sounds good. We try to um, time the recovery at watch change so the other ROV crews up to assist on deck. In the oncoming uh, watch. Makes sense. If you have a moment, do you think you could kind of explain that process for our viewers? How do we recover the ROV? Did you hear that, Dan? What's that? They, uh, they asked what the process is like for recovering the ROV. Yeah, I can, sorry, I can't hear her at all. That's a very faint voice in the background. Sounds like you're standing across the room. So I can't hear you either. I'm half deep. All right. It looks like another shark, or at least the last one, Brian. Oh, in the Atalanta well. view? Sorry, what was the question again? Um, they wanted to know what the process was for recovering an ROV. That also depends. That's pretty, uh, a good question, but pretty broad general question. So it varies from system to system. For Nautilus, it's um, we first recover Atalanta through the A-frame onto the back deck, and then um, there's a lift line that's married to our tether, and we uh, separate that and attach that to the crane, and then uh, fly Hercules around to the port side of the vessel and snatch it up with the crane into a sway limiter and then swing it on, on board and stick it in its uh, cradle. Thanks for the explanation. Have you been on the back deck yet to hook up at Atalanta? Me? Yeah. One is coming up? Yeah. No. I've been or in here. Or releasing it? No. I've been in here doing work or sleeping. It's on my list if I can. But I also don't want to be in the way. You're only in the way if you fall over. If I fall over, yeah. So we stand on the open back deck with some uh, carabiner hooks attached to tugger lines. And as Atlanta comes up to the surface, uh, two people hook the uh, spectra line into Atlanta. It's uh, some tuggers on the deck that assist with the recovery. While Hercules uh, streams aft 
to uh, kind of act as a aft tagline. Thanks for that visual. I assume it can get a little uh, more difficult when we're on rougher seas, um, pulling those lines in. I think it might be your volume, because everyone... Oh, really? She's loud for me. I think in this day and age we have technology to actually hear each other in the control van. Sitting like a foot and a half apart from each other? Yeah, without requiring a video engineer to constantly adjust the sound levels. But then it would be no fun for you, Angela. I was going to say, do you not want me here? What would you do if you didn't have to constantly tweak the listen to you telling me to zoom <laughs> <laughs> calling her the wrong name <laughs> yeah that too <laughs> yeah i'm horrible with names so. <laughs> what was i calling you At least I'm trying. She's it's just, hey you, Atlanta. Bridge snap. Jaina, is sound mixing something you do for your film projects as well? Um, usually in film, I mean, every single part of it has a different person doing a different job. Um, I do audio mixing on the side as well. Um, it's not particularly what I'm interested in, um, but when a job comes up and I'm available, I also do some audio mixing, but yeah, not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's helpful to be like a jack of all trades though, it sounds like. Oh yeah, absolutely. So what is your favorite um, component, then, usually, of a project? Uh, I like to be behind the camera, Ooh. holding the camera, pressing record. Cool, like getting the framing, I guess, mm -hmm. and the shots, and like um, like the color, I guess, mm -hmm. the color grading yeah. and all that <laughs> stuff. Cinematography, yep, right? Yep, absolutely. That's awesome. And for our viewers tuning in um, from Brazil, Czech Republic, Germany, Denmark, Spain, Hungary, Netherlands, Philippines, Australia, Italy, uh, Japan, the UK and Canada, the US, thank you so much for joining. We're um, almost to the summit of this unnamed sea mount all the way in the most um, northwestern uh, area of Papahanao Mokuakea. Um, so we started the dive um, at the bottom of this sea mount where we observed lots of large corals and um, some striking dramatic geological features and then we've been moving up um, slowly but surely towards the summit and now we're kind of focusing on getting to that final waypoint um, and then bringing the ROVs up and um, on this last part of our journey so far we've seen some pretty amazing stuff 
a Dumbo octopus earlier, a uh, shark came into the frame briefly. Um, so definitely we're sighting some different kinds of creatures um, up here in the um, top of this seamount. And thanks so much for joining us. Um, be sure to check out the different camera views um, to see if you can spot some different things from Atalanta's view versus Hercules. Um, and let us know if you see anything. So who picks the waypoints and why do we care about them so much? Um, Mia, if you're explaining, can you? Yeah, sorry. Um, the team got together, uh, and I know Val was talking about wanting to have uh, a lot of different points coming up to get different geological features. And then Virginia's research was looking at trawling at uh, um, like legacy markings uh, at the seamount top. So. That's why we had, we went from kind of from the bottom up. So a bunch of scientists walk into a room. Yeah. And then they throw, at a map. they throw darts at a map <laughs> and wherever they land, that's where we go. So a piece of rope walks into a bar. <laughs> he says, give me a beer. And the bartender says, can't give you a beer. Why can't you give me a beer? The piece of rope says, you're a piece of rope. Or it says, I'm not a piece of rope. He says, you're not? Oh. Says, no, afraid not. Oh, afraid second. not. Okay, yeah, yeah I got it. <laughs> oh. I got it. I was about to say, was there a bunch of... Yeah. No, no, it's a true story. <laughs> I think that's a grenadier. Grenadier? Yeah. That sounds Can't much nicer than, like, rat tail. <laughs> yeah. I think they actually... Um, Change the name to make it more palatable to eat. Oh. From rat tail to grenadier. To eat? Yes. I'm not sure we would eat this one since it's so deep. Yeah, but I think they, on they, the, the ones that live more shallow, I think are fished. Mm. Doesn't seem like a very effective fishery. I've never had it, have you? I do not like fish, so I have not tried this, but That's I'm, fair. Not, I'm not too sure. Um, I've never heard how it tastes, but I think it's pretty commonly fed on, honestly, but not too sure. <laughs> 